This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I am your host, Steve Gould. Welcome to the show. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for checking us out. If it's your first time, thank you for coming back. If you're a longtime fan, um, love you guys. Love the uh, all the ratings and reviewings I'm getting on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Five-star review. would be gr- very grateful for that. We're, I want to get to 1,000. We're at... Uh, high eights. I think we're almost at 900. We're very close. Um, Only a couple away from 900. So if uh, you guys could do that, I would truly appreciate it. Or or if you only listen on Spotify, I'll I'll take them there too. But Apple Podcasts is by far the largest largest purveyor of podcasts. So that would be greatly appreciated. Also, if you really, really love the show and you want to show me, you can go to Patreon. It's in the, the links in the show notes. You can go there. You can be a patrolman. You can be a sergeant. You get a couple different things with, uh, oh, over here, a couple of different uh, things with your your membership um, and direct access to me and all that stuff. So if you if you really love the show, you can go there. If you can't afford it or it's not in the budget, don't worry about it. This show is going to remain free. The point is to get the stories out of the men and women of law enforcement so that we can get a better appreciation for what they do every day. Uh, Today's guest is a SoCal copper, at least he started as a SoCal cop. He um, got his his start in a few different police departments in Southern California. He worked for the LADA's office, then as a special agent for the California Department of Justice. He was a member of the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force, then became the commander. After that, after his police career, he was then deployed overseas as an embedded counterterrorism, organized crime, subject matter expert. So clearly his police career was not enough. He had to go for more. Um, And then he is also the author of Outside the Wire, a very popular um, and highly rated book. So we're going to talk about all those things. Most importantly, we're going to get his war stories. So without further ado, let me bring on Gary Eddington. Gary. Hello. Hey, Hey. how are you? Good. Thank you for coming on the show, brother. My pleasure. I assure you. My pleasure. So SoCal, you think being a SoCal cop uh, would be enough action. Um, but you you started, How? which agencies did you work for there? I started out um, as a boot uh, with the Manhattan Beach Police Department. And then I lateraled to Beverly Hills Police Department and did a few years in the detective bureau there and got bitten by the investigator bug and uh, moved over to the DA's office and landed finally uh, at, uh, I worked major narcotics and and all kinds of stuff at the DA's office, and then uh, ended up at the California Department of Justice where I finished my law enforcement career. That's awesome. There's so much, there's so many paths you can take if you're in law enforcement in Southern California. I was there in the, you know, as a background Mr. Valley PD civilian uh, in their background unit, and even after that career, I became a fraud investigator for a private insurance company, and there's insurance cops. There's a whole ins- branch of insurance cops, right. in, uh, Department and they were of insurance. Yeah, they. I mean, badges, guns. You're, you're the starting rank is detective, and right. they were they were looking. I went to a meeting there because they'd have meetings with us, and they were they saw I was a younger guy, and they're like, you know, why isn't this guy a cop anymore? What you know? And they had an mm-hmm. opening, and they're like. Hey, we'll, we could look into it. We'll look at your academy from Massachusetts. Uh, we might be able to transfer you in. But the problem with that job, it's based out of Fresno. Oh, terrible. Oh, well, they have them in L.A. too. Yeah, maybe they didn't have an opening in L.A. But I think, well, uh, I think the Fresno office is probably hurting a lot because it's oh, horrible. Oh, Fresno. Uh, yeah. See, I filled up I've my been... company car there. I was afraid for my life. There was like people yeah. scurrying around the car looking at me. I'm like, I got to get out of here. I, I did a huge... IA case in in Fresno. I'm very familiar with Fresno. <laughs> I couldn't and that f- long drive up I five to get there. Yeah, oh my God. I lived in the high desert. Um, beautiful little spot right at the base of the mountains, at mm-hmm. the top of the Cajun Pass. So I would just shoot across the Mojave Desert. Uh-huh. Um, I actually thought it was awesome. You know, the big, huge Air yeah. Force base out there. And oh, yeah. um, you're just cooking across the desert. I get into Bakersfield and then up to Fresno that way. But yeah, um, yeah those two. Vice, um, Visalia was nice. I used to try to stay in Visalia, but um, uh-huh. Fresno and Bakersfield, yeah. I definitely because we'd have to wrap on doors, try to interview. Yeah, th- people would straight up come out, 
cussing me out. Gangsters. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. you know, they Not just surprised. see the, yeah. you know, the white guy with the briefcase and business yeah. cards, and they're like, get the F out of here, I'm effort. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. I, I told my boss, I'm like, listen, I, this guy tried to jack me up today. Like, I, I, went, I went on one. I was interviewing the guy, and when I came out, my tire, my rear tire had two punctures in it. Oh, and nice. he was a gangster involved in um, tuning up his daughter's car for money. And he goes, hey, man, just, uh, hey, pull it into the garage here. We'll take care of you. I'm like, I took off on a flat tire. And I, he's like, come back, come back. I'm like, I'm not going into a closed garage with you guys. The interview was terrible. He was breaking up a cup of ice with a knife, like a K-bar, while we were talking. And uh, I get to the gas station. I fill up. I get some fix-a-flat. I make it to my hotel. And I look at my tire, and sure enough, there's it's it's not the tread. There's two holes, like sliced like from a knife in the sidewall. I'm like, so sure yeah. enough, I must have been talking to the guy while I'm interviewing him. He must have sent a buddy out, and then like I don't know if it was going to be this will look good because we'll help him, we'll patch his tire, and like this will get some credit for us, or we're going to make him uh-huh. disappear. Yeah, going to make carjack, make him disappear. Yeah, it wouldn't have been, it would not have ended well. I'm I'm certain of that. You would have been on. You would have been a 2020 story. <laughs> <laughs> Gives me chills thinking about it, man. Because you just feel when you're not in law enforcement anymore and you're doing investigations like that. You know yeah. the it's a lot of ex cops doing it, and a lot of us carry. Um, yeah. Although the company doesn't really want that, there's no way you're not. But then if you get into it, you're not a cop. You know, yeah. so you're you yeah. got to carry insurance for that, and yep, it, it just was. Yeah. Um, I do. Yeah, for sure. Dance in a line, brother. So, yeah, Gary, you clearly have a a really interesting and big um, resume. I, I wonder, do you know um, former guest Chris Strom was a NYPD intelligence officer who went overseas and worked counterterrorism um, in the Middle East as well? I, I saw your resume and I thought, I wonder if he knows Chris Strom. He wrote a really great book. No, I don't. I did work um, with a couple of detectives from NYPD intelligence division. Yep, that's what he was. Um, but uh, but I and went to their headquarters one time and stuff like that. But no, I don't know that name off the top of my head. But he may have worked for the same company I went over there for. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was my – interviewing him was my first kind of delve into that. I didn't – I mean, I yeah. knew – I know big law enforcement agencies have people embedded places. Like New yes. York was sending people to get embedded in mosques after 9-11 overseas, mm-hmm. which was like – Wow, you, 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 well. yeah. you think that's, I thought that was reserved to like special agents for federal agencies, but no, they're, right. whatever, you guys have obviously have a level of um, knowledge and, and training that's um, just as good or better for those scenarios, clearly, if they're picking you guys to go. Well, I was actually, I had retired from DOJ, and um, this was a job that, that I uh, applied for uh, and was selected for. Um, as a retired guy, but those agencies do deploy people forward overseas and into D.C. and other places uh, as they should because, um, you know, I God bless the federal agencies themselves and the many friends I have over there and stuff, but there is a problem with the flow of, commu- of communication and ultimately – the people of the city of Los Angeles are dependent upon their protection from the, from the police department and the sheriff's department, and they expect that. And, um, and the Los Angeles Police Department uh, tries to do everything they can uh, to afford them that by, uh, and one of those things is trying to have people on the ground who can report that information straight back to cleared persons uh, within the police department who are authorized to have that information to make decisions. And, um, and that's why they do it. And I think it makes a lot of sense. You can't rely on the largesse of a federal agency um, for all your information if yeah, you're going to be, stay ahead of the curve. It makes sense. If you're a population center in this country, in L.A., right. New York, Chicago, you're the, that's where all the people are. I mean, that's where a ton of the people are. It makes sense that officers wouldn't be embedded over there. Um, Gary, that's a that's a tangent I'd love to go down, but we'll push it to later because I want to okay. ask, I want to ask about a young Gary Eddington, and who I'm talking about here is um, this guy. Maybe this guy was this your first time showing pictures of Gary? No, from that's his Beverly website? Hills. 
That's that Beverly Hills. That was my first day at Beverly Hills, which is the day that I saw the, t- the taser being deployed. But that is – I am in the academy, and I think I'm about to go on a uh, – that was taken at my uh, my girlfriend's house at the time, that picture of me standing there in the, the tan and green. Oh, okay. I was, I'm sure I was in the academy then, and I'm sure I was about to uh, – to go out uh, and work um, a uh, a shift at Manhattan Beach Police Department. And is that and your is that a canine or you just German Shepherd uh, pet? That was no, that was that was their dog. <laughs> <laughs> Both of the, neither of those dogs were police canines. The other one was my uh, was a Adobe female that we had at the time. Yeah, you got to see the so, picture if you're if you're on the podcast. It's all in the audio, but it, they're going up on YouTube now about a week after the podcast yeah. airs. But um, Gary's here. He's very young man. He's got the speed loaders, the revolver. Uh, There's actually room on his gun belt. There's like, what is this uh, big yeah. space? Shouldn't you be jamming yeah. that with heavy stuff? I have my I have my six inch model sixty six, and two speed loaders, and my PR twenty four, and one pair of handcuffs. It's great, man. I love yeah. it. So, um, what's the hot? What's your first hot call from one of those jobs you can remember? The first call that you were like, "Woo, this is intense." Well, I'll tell you. It occurred to me. Um, Probably the scariest thing that happened when I was a brand new baby face was um, got a call of a um, uh, 50, what we call a 5150, which is basically somebody who's whacked out of their mind, uh, armed, with a, uh, armed with a knife, terrorizing his family. And I was in training uh, with my FTO, with my field training officer. And um, as you read from my bio, my father was killed in the line of duty uh, while I was in the third week of the academy by a, a 5150 armed with a knife. Wow. So this is like something that is, uh, you know, pretty close to home. So I will never forget. And I was, I was pretty, pretty frightened because this guy was really, really whacked out of his mind. Young uh, male. Uh, standing in front of the house uh, on the porch, naked, um, with a big, big damn butcher knife in his hand, screaming at the top of his lungs and terrorizing his family. And we, we were afraid he was going to kill his family. And I'll never forget my FTO looking at me and saying, Gary, this is, this is before all that fancy crap, tasers or any of that stuff. Sure. He says, Gary, he says, I have my stream light, my flashlight, you know, big aluminum flashlight. Mm-hmm. I have my PR-24, and he says, if he comes past me, he says, you you got to shoot him. And I'm sitting there. I'm, I can still visualize looking down oh, at, the, at my 45 in my hand, and I'm going, this shit just got real big time. This was this was like, wow. Especially you know, with what happened to your father. That What an exactly. ominous call to get early on. Yeah, exactly. And the interesting thing about that was, and it, the wonderful part of that was that we were able to talk him down and get him in custody. And, you know, he was, you know, he must have been, you know, some sort of split personality or something or whatever. I don't know. But mm-hmm. he was so apologetic to his family afterwards. His mother was crying. His father was crying. And, we, I, and you know... You asked me about heartwarming. That was heartwarming also because I was so grateful that we didn't have to kill him and that the situation ended the way it did. And the parents, the family were so grateful that we didn't have to do it. And I know we were. Um, It was just – but the interesting thing, as I started to say, was I actually had two calls involving – involving – um, whack attacks armed with knives while I was in training in that three month training cycle when I graduated from the academy I don't know if God or somebody was testing me mm. because that didn't happen very often not in Manhattan Beach it did not happen very often and here I am faced fresh out of the academy you know just a, just a few months after my father is killed by a crazy guy I'm, I'm facing two crazy individuals armed with knives and in both instances, um, you know, they resolved peacefully. And certainly, like I said, the one with the boy, I remember so clearly because I remember how dramatic it was when he was finally calmed down and, and taken into custody. 
you know, his parents were crying and, and we were just so grateful that we didn't have to take his life. I was like, you know, I, it was just I really, imagine. pretty scary. And I can still, look, I, I close my eyes right now. I can still look, I can still see that pistol in my hand, right? We were like 10 feet away from the guy up against a hedge. And that was like pretty real. Oh Pretty my gosh, right. that is intense, yeah. man! How do you guys? Yeah. We call them a Section Twelve in Massachusetts. Same thing, fifty-one, uh-huh. fifty, Section Twelve. Yeah. Um, yeah. How how would you guys? I'm I'm just curious about the procedure of it. Would you? Uh-huh. Would you? You secure them, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. Then would you? Would you guys bring them? Would you have an ambulance come and then you follow the ambulance no. or go in the back of the ambulance with them? No, we would take them. Uh, to a mental, uh, a county medical, ho- mental hospital. Well, let me back up and say county hospital that had a medical ward there or a mental ward. As I recall, there were two in LA County we would use. One was up in the San Fernando Valley, all of you. And the other one was down in uh, Harbor area, Long Beach area down there. It was a county hospital down there. And um, for Manhattan Beach, we would always take them down to the one in, in, in uh in the harbor area if we could if they had availability sometimes they wouldn't have availability and we'd have to haul them all the way up to the valley um, so would you transfer you obviously transfer custody to to them would you would you get a warrant for when he was released or would you just do like a we call like a uh crim app like you just you you would charge him but he would be released to the custody of the hospital and then later be charged actually, if you're if you're going to charge him actually there were no criminal charges in either case and it rarely are there um, this, both these individuals were so obviously mentally disturbed that there was no way to, to, and there was no, I mean, obviously terrorizing your parents and threatening death and all that stuff is a crime. It's a felony and all that, but nobody was charged in that instance. Um, in, in, in California under welfare and institutions code 5150, and this is a long time ago, um, they had a 72-hour commitment. You'd take him to the hospital. The doctor would evaluate him, sit down and meet with him and say, yeah, he's crazy mm-hmm. or no, he's not. And if he's not crazy, then you got to figure out what you're going to do with him. And that meant usually bringing him back um, uh, and booking him if you could. But if not, um, then, um, then they stayed there and you're done. Off you okay. go. Yeah, no charges. That's the way to go, man. Yeah, see and you, if see you, you later. Exactly, and if you're going, and if you're, and if you're doing the one in all of you, you always stopped at Tommy's for a Tommy's burger on the way back. That's so funny you say that because I just, <laughs> I have an interview coming out with my old um, backgrounds manager, who was a, uh, a Maywood cop that you know uh-huh. Maywood got kind of collapsed up into the sheriff's department, but he was a sergeant oh, yeah. there on uh, James Williams, and we were going home one night after. Um, I'm going to tell the story twice now because it's on the other thing, but. We were going home, and he said, "Have you ever ha- have you ever been to Tommy's?" I said, "What's that?" And he said, "We gotta go because we we had been at work, then the then the brewery next yeah. door, and then he was driving me home, and we yeah. got these gigantic sloppy. I ruined my shirt. It was oh this. god, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> so oh, good yeah. though. Chili, it's a, it's a chili. Whatever they call it, it's chili. They say it's chili. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but they say it's chili. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was um. I was, I'd had a few uh, beers, so whatever it was, it went down easy. It didn't really matter. No. It didn't really matter. It went down easy. About 4 a.m., I sat up and was like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You better follow it up with uh, uh, some kind of antacid or you're going to be paid <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely, That's man. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I experienced it, though, because now I have a common bond with you SoCal guys, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, yep. Gary, can you describe uh, the strangest or most bizarre thing you dealt with in in any of your careers i know you probably have a bunch so <laughs> okay there are a few um but the one that pops it pops to mind immediately was i got a call i just dropped off my partner and i was working um uh graveyard shift and um i just dropped off my partner at the station he was writing he was going to write a report so i was in a an l car i was now an l car i was single man car and I got a call of an assault victim in the north end of Beverly Hills. So I'm like, okay, this could be interesting. So I pull up, black out, you know, do all the tactical things you're supposed to do. You know, I get out of the car and I start walking up the driveway or walking up the sidewalk, kind of creeping around. And, I, and this guy sees me and he says, 
Hurry, hurry, come quick. Paul Lind's been assaulted. I think he's dead. Ooh. Now, Paul Lind is a famous comedian from Hollywood Squares, Bewitched, a million different shows, right? So I'm thinking immediately, like, this is Hollywood. Everything's just a tiny bit weirder here. Yes. So this is Holy going to weird. Be an awful, awful Manson murders, overkill, <laughs> blood everywhere, bloody fingerprints, you know, all kinds of crap, right? So right. I'm like, oh, shit. So I, you know, pop my gun out and I've got it in my hand and we walk in. I walk in and I am immediately transported to something akin to the Twilight Zone. I walk into this house, and it was so strange. It was just, like, so weird. There was this huge, biggest standard poodle I've ever seen in my life walking around, black standard poodle walking around, a, a massive guy that probably had arms as big as my thighs, sitting over in the corner just crying his eyes out. And then this guy takes me into the bedroom, and there in the bed, uh, in a white canopy bed, is 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 Paul Lind and why he thought Paul had been assaulted was Paul had been dead for a while and had um, uh, basically f uh, post-mortem lividity which of course is the blood settled and it looks like bruising to to somebody who doesn't really know sure it looks like bruising he also was in an agonal position and, uh, you know, his arms were drawn up and he looked like, you know, it was typical what you would see and something like that. And um, there was um, a, a drug that um, was commonly used um, uh, to accentuate um, sexual amyl, activity. Amyl nitrate or something? Yeah, exactly. Something yeah. like that on the, on the nightstand next to him. Yep. And so what happened was um, these guys had – he Paul had failed to show up for his birthday party the day before. So they went to – or maybe it was that night. I don't remember now. It's been a long time. But they ended up breaking in to the house, and they discovered Paul in that situation. Uh, and, um, yeah, he had, da he had died of a massive, massive heart attack. And uh, but it was a very, very it was one of those things that was so strange when you literally when I walked in there, I was like, God, where is going on here? This is so weird. And it just kept getting weirder and weirder. My sergeant came out and, or actually a detective sergeant came out and he looked around. And he looked at the stuff on the nightstand. I didn't know what that stuff was. Yeah. I was such a big face. And <laughs> He told me what it was. I was like, "Oh God!" Yeah. So it was. Uh, it was a little tiny bit weird. <laughs> That's a weird one, man. Yeah. I similar to weird. similar to you. I I ran across a guy that had a OUI arrest, but he had a bag full of tricks in his trunk, dildos, and all this weird sex oh, stuff, God. ball gags. Then he had these drugs, <laughs> and I didn't know what they were. But he's like, "They're poppers. They're poppers." I'm like. That's, what yeah. what what would you call a popper? Because I'm I'm looking for the class of drug. I'm like, what do I charge uh, yeah. this this guy? So I called. I worked on Cape Cod at the time, in uh -huh. Provincetown was a few towns away. Huge gay community up there. Lots of partying. So I call their sergeant and I go, "What is a popper?" And he goes, "Amyl nitrate." It's you know he's like yeah. it's it's class D or class M whatever it was. He uh he told me what to charge and what it was and but yeah same thing. How would I know? I don't run into these exactly type of and, things. And it, it was called um, it, it, on the street in LA. It was called locker room. So draw your own conclusions from that, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah, Thank that, you very that, much. Is, that is a weird one. So when you guys, when you guys, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same as us. When you have a, a unintended body like that, you just you hang out for a homicide and then like the the um, medical examiner right. corner or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. The rules are if no physician is able to sign a death certificate, um, then, um, you know, with, a, with some kind of attributable cause of death, then uh, the coroner uh, uh, is the one who takes custody of the body. Yeah, man, I, I am not cool with that. I, I work in like a very small place, too. And it's like, there's always the chance you're gonna have to help put the person in the bag. And it's like, when some, oh, like you said, when when they are when they have rigor and then they they go to straighten them, it is like bone chilling to me. Oh, creepy! I just don't like oh, it when yeah. they straighten bodies out oh, to put them in the bag. God. I mean, I had one guy that was 
on the toilet, older guy, and he was <laughs> completely upright holding onto his walker like this. <laughs> Frozen. Not and, the way you want to go. <laughs> no. And, you know, he had like family over, like seven people sleeping over for the holidays. And God. I was asking the medical examiner, I'm like, how? What? And he had some, you know, he's like, well, what happens is, or he had a massive heart attack, whatever, the yeah. blood went here and he spasm, then froze. And there was a reason. But, you know, they yeah. got to get him out of that position and put him yeah. in the bag. And it's like, that's one thing, yeah. like, I think everybody has their, their weakness, but for me, that turns my stomach. I just don't like seeing the oh, human yeah. body, like, manipulated like that. It just I remember the first time I had to go to the coroner's office. I was a cadet at Culver City, and we'd had a homicide, and they needed me to go to the coroner's office to pick up some evidence, and I'd never been there before. In the, in the academy, you go to the coroner's office, and they delight in taking you around and showing you every gory thing there possibly is. And a similar thing happened to me that day because this guy is looking at me, and he's like, this is a baby face, right? Mm. So he takes me in the elevator down to the basement where, where everything happens, and as soon as the door opens, the smell hits you. And I know he watched the blood leave my face. And he took me the long way around to find the evidence. And it's a smell you don't, you don't forget. It's, it's not a pleasant smell. It's awful. And, uh, yeah, I've only been there a few times. Uh, and uh, one time was to look at, uh, look at some evidence on a really creepy unsolved homicide that I worked on for a while when I was with the Department of Justice. Uh, um, we called it the uh, the uh, the cock in the jar case. Oh, it really? The castration of uh, the male victim. Yes. Really? What what was yes. the backstory with that? Um, well, the backstory was that um, a local agency uh, was contacted by a young man who said this guy pointed to this guy who he'd lived with for a while and said this guy. You know, uh, I'm underage, and this guy had sex with me multiple times, picked me up on the street uh, out of state, and we drove around all over the country, and he had sex with me, brought me back to his house, and had sex there. Oof. And and um, so they execute a warrant on him, and he meets the detectives at the front door, and he says, he says, yeah, um, what you're looking for is in that file cabinet. And they're like, okay. <laughs> What? So they go, they go to the file cabinet, and it ain't what they're looking for. It's one of those big. Ain't jars nobody that, looking for that. No, nobody's. Looking, and let me tell you something. It's a scary thing to look at, too. Trust me. Um, anyway, it's in one of those big jars that that people, usually wives, have all of their like pasta or olive oil and okay. all this stuff. You know those big heavy glass jars, and um, it was in that, and. Uh, it was in um, uh, alcohol in that jar. And, of course, that's not what they were looking for, but it certainly opened up a whole can of worms. And they worked it for a while. Then they gave it to the Department of Justice, and another investigator worked on it for a while. Uh, and then I picked it up and, and thought it would be kind of interesting to play with for a while. And so I did some investigation on it, and I went to um, – so the guy um, who answered the door, Gary, was that the kid he'd that been was abusing? The suspect in the, that was the suspect in the, um, in the child molestation case. Oh, I was thinking it was the kid he had abused and the kid took out revenge. No, no, no. It was the suspect in the child molestation case who then became a suspect in a, uh, a murder investigation. But unfortunately, we were never able to find the actual victim because the... Well, there were a couple of things that happened. First one was the pathologist, when he did an examination on it, on the, the specimen, he took it out of the alcohol and put it in formalin, you know, and then when he was done, he put it back in the alcohol, which killed, according to the, the lab people that we had, the Department of Justice, it, it pretty much ruined the DNA. So oh. we really couldn't. We had two possible candidates that we had, dis, that we had found um, through – uh, Vicap through FBI. Um, uh, one was in uh, Pennsylvania, and the other one was in um, in Utah. I think it was Utah. Anyway, both victims were rural body dumps. Both victims had been posed in a specific way, and both had a similar um, uh, wound pattern. Uh, 
And he and was cutting their wieners off? Was it like a trophy for the him? The whole package, yeah. It's cro- laterally across the pubic bone and then uh, basically like a triangle uh, back to the anus. And oh, it's my removed. gosh. I told you it's wow. bad. It's really bad. So wow. the, 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 the two, both those victims were killed with the same weapon. Both mm. victims were killed with the same weapon. Um, but um, I... Um, uh, I did some research and discovered that the jar was from England. So I, um, I was on a trip over there to London, and so I contacted the uh, National Police College in London and talked to their, their, their criminal profiling unit and said, hey, have you had anything like that? And they said, no, that's really creepy. Um, <laughs> Don't call us again. <laughs> he, said, he said he was laughing. He said, that's really weird. We've never had anything like that. But you should call the Germans. Um, <laughs> so, so I called the Germans. <laughs> I called the Germans. And the Germans said, no, that's so creepy. Call the Dutch. <laughs> so I called the Dutch. <laughs> that's awesome. And I talked to this guy. I talked to this detective. And he said, he said, you know, he said, we're very proud of our very liberal you know, policies in, in, in Holland, you know, as far as sexuality and all that stuff. But he said, even that's too creepy for us. <laughs> wow. Only so in America, went, okay. baby. Yeah. So that case is, as far as I know, that case is still unsolved. We found some other evidence later on. Uh, another person took it over after I got promoted and moved into internal affairs. But um, it was it was really a, a fascinating case. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story, another funny story about that. So I went to West Hollywood because part of this case centered around West Hollywood because the suspect in the case whose house this was found in um, wrote fantasies, okay, gothic fantasies about uh, castration. So I went to a bookstore in West Hollywood on Santa Monica Boulevard that's no longer there and identified myself, told them I was investigating a homicide, and do you have any books on castration? Now, you would normally think that they probably wouldn't, but guess what? They did, and they were sold out. Oh, okay? That's a lot of leads, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my oh, God. It was like, so I need you to start taking ID here. when you sell these books. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can you imagine? They're sold out. It was if, uh, as if I had just asked for the latest Martha Stewart cookbook. He says, oh, sure. Took me right over where the spot where it would be, and he says, I guess we're sold out. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> Man. Hollywood yeah. is okay. so, such a weird place. So there you go. I guess I I guess I, I gave you a couple of weird stories there. Yeah, those are those are fantastic. <laughs> People are gonna love those and they're gonna be very cringy. Um yeah. that reminds me of I, I one of the early on in the podcast I interviewed um uh, a guy who was uh West Hollywood deputy sheriff stationed there <laughs> and, and um <laughs> His some of some of his stuff was just. I mean, mm. he. I mean, he walked by an alley and caught a guy fisting another guy while the guy was passed out, and yeah. then he kind of gets himself yeah. free and runs over to him, and he's like, "Oh hell no, <laughs> do not <laughs> touch me." <laughs> yeah, uh, I was a I was a once again a baby cadet at Culver City. I mean, as baby, as baby, as naive as could be, and they did a search warrant on a print shop that printed those magazines. And uh, for the, for this, it was called the Crisco Kid, believe it or not. Oh, boy. <laughs> and I saw these magazines, and I was like, oh, my God. I was yeah. so shocked and appalled, and I was like, Oh wow! This yeah. is just—I mean, huh? <laughs> the depravity. It's like, oh yeah. my god! Yeah, I mean, I just can't even—I can't even imagine. I, de- I just defies any kind of rationale that I can conceive of. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. My goodness, geez, I think I—I your- never worked vice. I never ever worked vice. With all these stories I have, I've never worked vice. <laughs> Man, that's—I mean, that's just—you're you're just going to get that. Just, just being a beat cop. That you're just yeah, gonna get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, those are good, Gary. <laughs> those are really good. <laughs> good. Um, can you can you tell us about a time, uh, or maybe the most uh, intense moment you had on the job, most terrifying moment? 
Oh, um, well, um, certainly that one story I told you about when I was a, a, a rookie. Oh, um, there was uh, another incident um, in Manhattan Beach. I was riding with my FTO, as a matter of fact. And uh, we went in pursuit of a vehicle for a um, uh, vehicle code violation, traffic. And the guy accelerated to um, ungodly speeds uh, down um, – what the hell street was that called? Anyway, it doesn't matter. But anyway, Marine – no, it wasn't Marine. Anyway, going down this street, and he gets to um, – he gets to um, – uh, a street that follows the ocean and he makes a right and as he makes a right all this stuff starts flying out the windows and it's bags of cocaine okay and he is going like a bat out of hell and we're going like a bat out of hell and we're going through some curves and it's it's called the s curves there it's near a power station and um it's it's either in el portal or el segundo anyway he gets into the s curves and he loses control of the vehicle and spins around, flips, um, smacks up against a fence, very dramatic, bursts into flames. And I'm like, oh, my God. If, you know, it was crazy. And I jumped out of the car and my FTO jumped out of the car and he ran over and uh, – and was able to drag the guy out of the car as it was burning. And I was like, wow, that was crazy. I actually, you know, there was a, um, yeah, that was another incident I had. It was also at Manhattan Beach, which was scary. I was drive, I was now off a of training and minding my own business, driving down <laughs> Pacific Coast Highway at probably 1 o'clock in the morning. And I'm driving along northbound. I'm at Mar just before Marine, and it's a hill. And I see this guy in front of me kind of go across walking across the street way ahead of me you know probably 70 80 yards ahead of me cro crossing the street in front of me and then all of a sudden i hear this smack and i see this thing fly through the air it looked like a sack of rags look like a duffel bag flying through the air and he crashes into the center divider and his body is wrapped around a a um you know, uh, sprinkler head, one of those tall sprinkler heads. It's yeah. literally wrapped around the sprinkler head. And I get on the radio and I scream, you know, injury TA, uh, you know, roll paramedics, blah, 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 blah. And, and all the guys that were out there working thought I had hit the guy because I was so, like, excited, you know, because <laughs> yeah. I'd just seen a guy practically get killed right in front of my eyes. And so they're rolling code three there, thinking that I was the one who hit the guy. And, no, uh, you know, it turned out to be a DUI driver and all of this stuff. But it was crazy. It was like, wow, you know. That's uh, nuts. I swear, it's the drunkest human beings I've ever met in my life were in Manhattan Beach. Oh, I, I believe think, it. I don't think they allow you in that town unless, you are blo unless you're capable of blowing like a, a 1.5 or a 2.0. I mean, man. Th those highways running – along the coast pch yeah those are because when we lived there we would go we went to those beaches a few times a couple different yeah. places because that goes way up and you yeah. got to cross it you know um the cars go so fast and you mm -hmm. you literally have people in bikinis and bathing suits in boogie boards bare feet running across that highway when people are going yep. like 70 and i yeah. was talking to a cop up there and he's like oh yeah he's like we've had people just cut in half just, oh yeah, like I'm in sure. their bikinis, like one top, the top of the woman's here, the the bottom's over here. He goes, it's like, it's so frigging dangerous that area for yeah, pedestrians. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know it. Yeah, I absolutely. Um, and I can I can think of several spots that are like that where people do that, and I'm sure that that's the case because people aren't paying attention. Uh, maybe they're looking at the girls walking by. Maybe they're drunk or what, whatever, and smack. Somebody gets whacked. Uh, you know, that, yeah. that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, we. I mean, it, it's it's such a weird thing. I came from the East Coast, grew up on Cape Cod, where the beaches are just pristine, but they're right. always being eroded. 
they're always uh-huh. getting smaller or sandbars are being formed or there's breakthroughs from the inlet. Co- and they're just always under, they're in battle with mother nature. Uh-huh. In California, it's like that doesn't happen. So you were able to build a city on the beach, which there are several. And right. so it's it's such a a weird scene when you go there that it's like the beach is so beautiful um, and they can groom it and it never goes away. It's just always the same beach. But all the yeah. shop that then like so close to that is are, are legitimate cities with like legit big city problems. Like when we would go to Santa Monica, we would just right. want to go like get the kids a smoothie or get a coffee at Starbucks and there would always be a crazy person in there shouting or the chief, the chief, um, the chief, the police were chasing somebody down or they were being filmed right. and the people filming them were screaming that they were racist. It was like, this is the, the beach is supposed to be relaxing. What, but you know, right across the highway, people are living their lives, you know, have raising hell. It's just it's so weird for me as a Cape Codder. It's a weird thing to experience. Well, you know, it is, we used to, I mean, Beverly Hughes, Hills used to att- seem to attract uh, a lot of crazies and a lot of transients, and um, the beach does as well. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it's like it's like they're walking west and they reach the ocean and they can't go any further, so that's where yeah. they stay. You guys you know? don't have that natural culling effect that we have. It gets to yeah. zero here, so these yeah. people are. That's true. That's They're not true. living on the beach. They're just dying. So in California, yeah, exactly. you could, in California, you see 80-year-old homeless people, and you're like, you'd never make it in Boston. You would be dead because the shelter yeah. would close, and you were drunk, and then you would just die in the street and freeze to death. Yeah, yeah. There is the natural selection in, in Southern California rarely has anything that is, is rarely dependent upon the weather. That's for sure. Although, of late, it's, they've had a lot of unseasonably cold and wet weather. But usually, no. You know, yeah. people can live on the street forever up there. Is part of that the um, part of it with the crazy people has got to be that people go there to quote make it in whatever right art form they're in, acting, comedy, um, graphic design, Music. whatever it is. They want to be part of the big show. They inevitably don't make it. They hit the party scene, and then now they're forty five and they're they're just crazy. They're walking around with no pants on. It seems like there's a lot of that going on. I'm not sure exactly what the progression is, but that sounds probably <laughs> right. I, I just, think that's probably true. I think some people come out there, you know, with visions of grandeur and vision themselves walking up on the stage and collecting the Oscar or the Grammy or whatever, and it doesn't happen. And, uh, you know, they resort to drugs and alcohol, and uh, it just spirals out of control. And before they know it, the, their their lives are ruined. I think that's probably a very common thing. Or they resort to crime. Yeah. You know. We had we had regulars that when I was a guard at Harry Winston for extra money, there was regular crazy people in, in Beverly Hills that would, you know, yeah. weekly would come in. And, you know, everybody in the boutique would roll their eyes. like Because uh, Harry Winston is very, it's like walking into Downton Abbey. Like, it's like. Right. Every customer that comes in gets attention. They get catered to. It doesn't matter who they are. Even these these people that um, you know are just crazy and they're not going to buy anything. They still the employees would cater to them, right. get them a water, a soda. Oh, let me take right. out that you know four million dollar watch for the two <laughs> hundredth time. You're not going to buy right. it. You're crazy. You took a and bus to get bad. you. Yeah, and you're you smell terrible and you look nuts. <laughs> And the, to to me, it was like a little. It gave me a little bit of pleasure because the people who work in those boutiques, um, and I don't want to pigeonhole them, but they are uh, very judgmental. Let's say because I would hear all the conversations when someone would leave, and they're elitist themselves. They of are. Course. I mean, because they're making quarter million dollars selling this stuff a year as a salesperson, and. To see them have to deal with that, having been a cop, it was just kind of refreshing. Like, yeah, right, yeah, this is the real world, okay? Because yeah, people yeah. would come in, like a nice couple would come in, and they'd be like, you know, the engagement ring start at nine fifty, nine hundred fifty thousand. Not because they're, I mean, they're great diamonds, but they're it's because it's Harry Winston. That's why, right, right. And you know, people would come in and just be like, oh, honey, I'm really sorry, or that you could tell the dude was like, he made money, but like not that kind of money, and. They would just trash them 
What a cheap piece of crap. You can't even buy your fiance. If you can't buy her that ring, you don't even deserve her. It was like, that's the price of a house in this neighborhood. Like, that's insanity. But yeah, it was nice. It was a little just desserts, you know, to see the Sally, the bag lady, come in and throw her stuff everywhere and demand (laughs) a water. It was like, yeah, do your thing. That's your yeah. potential sale right there. Um, we definitely had some some transos. We used to call them transos uh, that were just fixtures, you know, in the area. Yeah, why not go in here? He wins and get a water and a cookie. Go to Gucci, yeah. get something else. Hey, I got my snack. I'm full. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was funny to watch. But Gary, um, you're gonna have to dig deep. A lot of cops have to dig deep for this. But can you tell me uh, a heartwarming encounter? If you don't have one. I understand, but um. let me think here. Um, Getting the kitten out of the tree or had, something? No, no, <laughs> no. Um, heartwarming. Um, well, I would say actually, it was more sad than heartwarming. There was a we did a search warrant on uh, a. Um, it was a it was a um, meth case, and uh, there were kids there, and um, I mean it was really sad. It was just sad. I mean it, there was very. I mean the fact that that you know the 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 mother was was absent and the father was cooking this stuff and they had to live in it was pretty bad. But it. I mean, when the people came to take them and, you know, they were so sweet and wonderful to them and so reassuring and so um, so sensitive to their plight that it was it re, it was reaffirming that there is decency in humanity in the world. Yeah. Uh, and there are people who are selfless, who care and who who are put themselves out uh, to do that. And um and I would say there haven't been many things like that. I have to say, uh, not a lot of heartwarming things. Most of it's not so great. But I was very touched by that. Yeah. So uh, that sticks in my mind. It was such a disgusting, foul place too. It was unbelievable. You wouldn't keep you wouldn't keep your worst dog in that place. I mean, it was so disgusting. Oh man. And they were living in it, and it was just so pathetic. It's one thing if you do it to yourself and you're an adult, but when you got the right. innocent lives in there, it's like so brutal. Yeah, exactly. Well, well hey, that's yeah. about that's on par with everybody else's heartwarming story, so don't yeah. don't worry. <laughs> there, there's like a dark side to all the heartwarming stories. You know, the cops don't really pull the kitties out of the trees. We yeah. don't. The fi- like we let the firemen do that. Let them do that. You know, one guy I, likes the firemen. I, yeah, they're the good guy. I always say when if I get to a medical first, I go, "Don't worry, the good guys are on their way." Um, yeah. I have one, I can't remember who it was, but I remember the story one guy interviewed and he said, uh, the whole story was this kid's mom's head got blown off in, in front of him and her head got all over him. And then he was raised by like an uncle or aunt. And then later he showed up at the police station to thank him and to let him know that his life was okay. And it was like, kind of heartwarming, but pretty, yeah. uh, <laughs> once again, there's a dark aspect to this. Right. Mom's it's head dark. blew off. <laughs> that's pretty bad yeah oh yeah so it's kind of unfortunately yeah. in police work it's kind of it's kind of always like that um yeah pretty much gary can you talk about i'm interested to hear about um how you parlay being a you were the commander of the doj terrorism right. task force with the fbi is that all one well basically basically we were we were a component of the joint terrorism task force um, and we had, I was embedded with the Joint Terrorism Task Force from 1999 to when I retired in 2008. And after 9-11, uh, I stood up the task force in Los Angeles and we, we had jurisdiction initially from the San Diego County line to Monterey. And then eventually we got another task force in Orange County. Uh, so that eased up things a little bit. But basically I felt like the FBI is the one who has original jurisdiction in all terrorism cases, so we need to have people embedded with them yeah. and participating and uh, being part of the process. And so that's what we did. We embedded special agents and intelligence analysts uh, with the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. And then eventually 
as as time um, as time uh, moved on and memories got weaker, um, you know, when the Department of Justice started to draw down um, the task forces, um, they they um, made me the the task force commander for all of our individuals who were in, assigned to the eight JTTFs in uh, California from uh, San Francisco, Sacramento, Fresno, Riverside, you know, L.A., all of it. So I supervised all of those people. Um, so, where, so where would you have agents? Like where would you put them? Like how were, how were like field agents distributed? They were, they were assigned in, in, in L.A., um, they were assigned, well, initially we had them in the Orange County uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force and in the Los Angeles Joint Terrorism Task Force. And, uh, and then Orange County spun off and became its own task force. And so those, they, they had their people embedded with that. And initially, I, it was myself and one other agent. And then uh, I got an analyst in there. And I got a couple more agents in there. And basically, you know, we had a desk. We sat at a desk uh, along with uh, the FBI agents and all the other task force members because you had people there from LAPD, LA Sheriff's, you know, you name the agency and they were there. Who, who uh, was um, feeding the investigations? Like, where, where were you? Like in a typical department, it would be patrol was kind of feeding investigations. What, was it, were you getting it from local guys mostly or was it leads from the FBI? Um, well, actually, um, it worked a couple of different ways. Um, there were cases that we were assigned by uh, the FBI to work, or they spun off and gave them to us because they couldn't really work them. Um, and, and what we would do, our mission was to, um, to build a package, a target package on the suspects, and then hand it off to a enforcement agency. We did a lot of work with the Los Angeles Police Department uh, uh, counterterrorism section at Major Crimes Division and uh, their criminal guys and we gave them a lot of cases and we did uh, and um, we spun them off to other agencies uh, and so basically we developed target packages. Some of that stuff we developed on our own uh, through our own informants. Some of it were citizen call-ins, and um, and some of it was from other agencies, um, other law enforcement agencies. One of the things that I did was go around and 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 speak to other agencies and tell them, you know, if you see something, because a local law enforcement, the, the they're they're really like the first line of reporting. Sure. On on intelligence, and also their individuals, they could unwittingly um, uh, come in contact with somebody, a, a terrorist, or somebody who's associated with, with uh, you know, more likely it's going to be somebody who's an associate or a supporter, um, and or providing some kind of assistance than an actual bomb throwing terrorist. Although that did happen a few times. What uh, uh, what terrorist group kept you the busiest? Um, I would say that we did a lot of stuff uh, involving uh, – initially, it had to do with Hamas uh, because we did some – there were some funding nodes, um, it char- Islamic charities in California that were actually sending money to Hamas. Oh, wow. Uh, and um, so there was that initially, and then um, – we had a lot of stuff involving uh, lesbian, Lebanese Hezbollah and that kind of thing. And if you are working on Hezbollah, then you're also working, um, you know, individuals associated with uh, Iran. Because wow. Iran is basically calling the shots for Hezbollah or supporting Hezbollah. That's wild. Now, you guys were also not just terrorism, but also intelligence, right? So did you, yes. did you deal with... Um like Armenians at all? Um, no, um, not in that particular situation. Unless, unless now there are Armenian terrorist groups. There were, there were. I'm saying that because at Glendale like, is that huge. They're notorious yes, for like absolutely. being like the mafia almost. Well, there's a there's a huge Armenian community uh, in in that Glendale area, uh, and um, we didn't get involved in. Uh, organized crime investigations 
Um, we would get involved in something if it had a nexus in some fashion or another to terrorism. If it's Armenian, it's not going to be Islamist terrorism. It's going to be uh, related to um, either again, you know, something uh, targeting Turkey, or uh, because Armenians are Christians. Right. Um, so, or it's going to be uh, something targeting, um, you know. Something in the Middle East, perhaps Iran or or somebody else who has uh, you know abused the uh, Armenian community. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, Armenia is quite the place. I I met a lot of great Armenian people when I was in um, yeah. L.A. and um, actually our neighbors were Armenian. They like you know introduced introduced to us a lot of cool a lot of cool food, a lot of cool like their coffee. Oh, yeah. Those little coffees they have is kind of like espresso. Oh, yeah. It's delicious. Baklava but, is crack cocaine. Yeah, it's good. She had the, this woman next door used to make it, and um, he, oh. the husband, showed me pictures of like you know Armenian, just being like a naive guy that didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't ever go. Let me Google Armenia. See what that, it's incredible over there. There's a lot of technology. There's some really nice cities. Like I think just being oh, American, yeah. we we get like thinking like we're it, it's so big here. We're all there is, you know, or whatever. But right. when I think of Armenia, no, I don't. Really yeah, I don't think of like cities that look just like here. But really, it's like quite amazing over there that's kind of a tangent but I, no I no I, I it's true uh very very successful people brilliant people um you know um very hard working uh very shrewd businessmen mm -hmm. uh, you know no question about it yeah absolutely um gary do you have um any stories from overseas any tight tight spots any hairy situations you got into over there <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and were you armed over there or were you kind of like yes, be, being protected? Yes, I was. Okay. If you read my book, if you read my book, I have some rather choice things to say about uh, the weapon I was carrying okay. outside the wire. And and basically, there is an incident that is recounted in the book. I think the title of the chapter is called Wrong Turns. And basically, it's kind of a different version of of uh, a fictionalized version of what actually happened to me one time at night at uh, at uh, Victory Base in Baghdad. Um, but uh, yeah, I carried a M9 Beretta. <clears throat> I called it a paperweight, or in the book I call it the M9 annoying device. Okay. You know, with nine millimeter ball ammo, a gun that's way too big for its purpose. Uh, I'm not a fan. So you couldn't uh, carry anyway, what you wanted then. They just they just gave you the gun. They get, yeah, that was why I, I – yes, exactly. Um, I uh, – so anyway, yeah. So one time I had to go meet with one of the guys that worked for me at another base that's part of the Victory Base Complex. It's a huge base that encompasses uh, BIOP, uh, which is Baghdad International Airport, Victory Base Complex, Stryker, uh, just a b Liberty – like a bunch of different base uh, camps. They're all mm -hmm. camps. They call them camps. So I had to go over to Stryker, and I had dinner with this guy. I had lunch or dinner with this guy. And when I went over there, it was sunny. But when I came back, when I had to drive back, it was dark. And there are no street signs. <laughs> mm. And everything looked a lot different at night. So basically what happened was <clears throat> I started – heading that direction back. To, and I have a really good sense of direction. I can find my way around things pretty well. So I made my way back to a checkpoint. I remember going through that checkpoint on the other way. So I went through on the, on the, the reverse side. And then I got in behind a, a convoy of a bunch of uh, Humvees and MRAPs and stuff. And I'm following them. And then we go to another checkpoint. And... It's all looking good. They make a right turn. I bumper lock them and make the right turn. And I'm in a white Ford Ranger. And I don't have my helmet or body armor or anything else. All I have is my empty M9. By the way, the guns are empty. What? I, don't, I, I, should, I hasten to tell you, yes. Yes. Um, they only give you bullets for like base, a mission? or your, your gun is empty on base. You have to carry a couple of magazines or at least one magazine with you. Um, but the gun is empty and on safe um, in Whoa. your holster. 
yeah, it's really good. So anyway, so I make a right turn behind the convoy, and I'm tooling down. I didn't realize this, but I was now on off the base on um, the road that I think is called the Baghdad Airport Road. And the convoy pulls over to the right, and I drive past them. And I'm thinking, well, that's weird. Why did they do that? They picked a spot to pull over. That's kind of odd. Um, <clears throat> and so I continue driving, and then I start seeing green tracers flying in the air. Happy Fire, we called it. They called it Happy Fire over there. And I start seeing minarets, and I and there's these sound walls on both sides of the what's road. A, what's a minaret, to, Gary? Uh, you know, the, the, the things at the top of, of uh, a tower, uh, it's like a it's like an onion shaped dome at the top of a tower. Oh, okay. Uh, that is a tower is where the the uh, clerics do the call to prayer, or the call to prayer is, is broadcast from that tower. Okay. And you see those in the in the in the, the Middle Eastern world all over the place, and you hear the call to prayer at certain hours of the day, uh, throughout the day. And it's anyway. So I'm driving along, and I'm going, okay, this is really not looking terribly familiar to me and then i realized that i have driven off the base and i am in indian country as they say (laughs) oopsie pie (laughs) with an empty gun with an empty exactly oopsie pie (laughs) with an empty gun uh and a middle finger and that's about as much as i got right so there is this um this this a four-lane divided highway and in the middle is this wide divider, and it's all that red, soft, really fine sand. So I drop her into first gear, jump the curb, go, you know, praying to God that this thing oh. traction. And literally, I get over the curb, and I'm now on the sand, and I'm going along, and it starts to bog down, and I'm like, "Come on, baby, come on, baby, come on, baby," and I, I, I coax it over to the other side and jump the curb on the other side and get it over, and I'm back on the road, and now I'm like, "Okay, so now where the f do I go? Okay, <laughs> how do I get back to the base?" So I'm going along, and all of a sudden I see all these really bright lights at what looks like an off ramp. So I'm thinking, okay, that has to be a checkpoint. And it was, thank God. And I will never forget the contractor <laughs> standing there. One of them was a contractor from uh, the Congo and the other guy was a Belgian and they were laughing their asses off when I told them what had happened. They thought that was the funniest thing in the world. I didn't think it was that funny. And I will know, I, when I finally got back to that, uh, that uh, my hooch there, my my place where I stayed, I was I was like, oh my god, I need a drink. Of course, you can't get a drink anywhere around there, but I needed one bad. <laughs> yeah. Man, that was like that could have ended very badly for me. Very yeah. badly. I did mean, crap in my pants. I, yeah. I mean, on a much smaller scale, I did that down uh, in San Diego. Um, I almost drove into Mexico, and you know, I'm armed and everything else, <laughs> and I'm just following. Also a problem. Exactly. So I'm, but I'm in these neighborhoods just outside Mexico for an investigation, and I almost drove to the into the checkpoint, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to be screwed." I have a gun, like I don't know how understanding they're going to be. You know what I mean? Not at all. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I got to be careful, man, because you were there was parts in San Diego where I would drive, and then you could see over, and the contrast is incredible. You'd see Mexico oh, yeah. right there, and oh, it just yeah. looked like shanty oh, town, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of spooky. I mean, nothing like that, but I, I know the feeling of being like going yeah. somewhere you can't get away from or can't get out of. Oh my gosh, um, that would have been really bad. They would have taken your gun away from you, probably your car, and you would have been lucky if you walked away with your freedom. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking all that. I was like having a you know a panicked moment. I was like, what am I doing? Oh yeah, oh, um, oh, oh yeah, Gary. So I've had you over an hour. I appreciate your time, sir. I just have sure, uh, not at all one other question having for a great you. Time. Glad to hear it. Um, so, new people out there getting into law enforcement, uh, do you have some sage advice for them after this big career you've had? What would you tell somebody who's thinking about it, either state, local, or federal? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, my usual advice to young people is um, try to go federal if possible. 
Um, uh, I think, unfortunately, I mean, to be very, very honest with you, I think uniformed policing is a very perilous thing to be in now. You can have – you can be the most moral, decent, upstanding individual that ever walked – the earth and carried a badge and still find yourself in a world of hurt yeah. just because you were assigned to respond to a scene and you get sucked into a maelstrom of bad things. Um, and that doesn't even count the fact that people want to kill you and ambush you and all these things that are happening now too. I'm just talking about the legal aspects. Um, but thank God there are still young people that want to do it. Um, my advice is um, – uh, initially, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Actually, keep your mouth shut a lot <laughs> in law enforcement because that's one of the things that gets cops in trouble is their mouths. Yeah. And um, uh, so, you know, mind mind that. And also, um, always, no matter what is going on around you, always do the right thing. And um, it, never... You know, never cover for somebody else um, because you are going to end up as collateral damage, even though you are not uh, a uh, a person that's a principal involved in it, whatever it is. And, and you know, I mean, guys make mistakes. Guys sometimes do stupid stuff mm -hmm. um, because they get caught in the moment for whatever reason. Uh, don't be honest. Don't lie. Tell the truth. Um, and, um, you know, those are things that I would recommend to to anybody starting in the business, um, you know, for sure. Awesome. Good stuff, Gary. Thank you. Before before we sure. part ways here, um, talk to us about the book a little bit. I know I, sure. it's really cool because it's a novel, right? It's not. Um, yes, it is. It's not, it's it not is. a collection of war stories. It's an actual novel. No, it is not. Although there are a couple of war stories in there that, that are drawn from life real life experiences actually there's a chapter called um shots fired officer down that's kind of about what happened with my father and my experience there in a way it's mm -hmm. different um and uh like i said uh right turns and there are a few other things uh that happened to me in iraq that are portrayed in the book the book outside the wire is a uh, it's inspired by my experiences in my law enforcement career in the United States, as well as uh, my experiences in Iraq as an embedded advisor with uh, the Army's uh, improvised explosive device de defeat cell. And um, uh, it is very fast paced. It's been well received to the point where people have told me I need to write another one. So I actually am writing nice. another one. I'm writing uh, – I'm bringing back the same characters uh, or some of the same characters, those that survived. <laughs> Very cool. Because a few don't. Um, but um, I am uh, bringing – I am uh, uh, writing a sequel that takes place a couple years later. And um, uh, it is available uh, at Amazon and uh, Barnes & Noble online. It's in, it's in a couple of bookstores, but for the most part, the easiest way to find it is Barnes and Noble or Amazon online. And well, I'll and, put a link uh, right in the show notes. So if you're listening, awesome. you want to grab the book, you can just go to the show notes and click on it right yeah. there. I you you will have my my undying gratitude. <laughs> but that's a good thing to have. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed, yes. No, I'm sure for people sure. are gonna. People are going to want to pick it up. It's not, your your career is fascinating, man, and thank I you. really thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was an honor to have you on. Uh, thank you oh. for giving me your time and, and sharing those stories My with pleasure. people. A link to the um, the book will be in the show notes. Like I said, I'll put it on the website. And uh, when you get the second one going, or when you need a little um, a shout out or whatever, just let me know. You're a friend of the show now. Roger we'll, that. We'll get it thank out there, you. brother. And uh, um, I assure you, I will, because yeah. this is the worst part of writing is this damn promotion crap. I know, you know, oh, my God. And, and social media. I don't know anything about Instagram or any of that stuff. I'm having to learn. And it's just, ugh, yep. God, it's a big it's, learning curve, man. It is a huge learning curve, a huge Absolutely. learning curve. But I have had such a great time speaking with you. It's brought back some 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 fun memories. And uh, I really appreciate it. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you, Gary. Hey, I'm going to do the outro. Can you hang out for um, a uh, couple of seconds? Absolutely. All right. I'll be right with you, sir.
Guys, the great Gary Eddington. Crazy stories, man. What a career. Hold on. Holy cow. Um, go pick up his book. The link will be in the show notes, of course. It is uh, Outside the Wire. And, uh, guys, thank you for joining us uh, for this for this interview. And I uh, encourage you if, you, if you like the interview and you, you like this sort of thing, go back to the back catalog. There's over um, 140 uh, hours of interviews on here. Perfect for binging. If you, if you do love it and you want to give me a little, a little fist bump, Apple Podcast five star review. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, and besides that, you can go to Patreon and, and join up if you really, really love the show. But I um, uh, appreciate you guys. Thank you for joining us, and I will see you next week. <laughs>